Okay. All right. So uh, welcome to our first colloquium of the year of the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. Uh, the center, as some of you know, um, originated in 2004 at George Mason University, then moved to Temple University for a bit, and now is housed at the Graduate Center of City University of New York as part of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies. Um, Normally, we have a reception after our uh, talk and Q&A, but alas, this time it will be not only BYOB, but bring your own venue. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we can't offer our usual wine and cheese. Uh, but we do have uh, food for thought with um, our first talk. I'm really delighted to welcome Nicole Hassoun back to the center because she actually uh, gave us a talk previously in person. And it's really wonderful to follow her new, uh, new thinking on such an important uh, uh, and pressing contemporary issue. So as you, as you might have read, Nicole is a professor of philosophy at Binghamton University and currently is a visiting scholar at Cornell. Uh, she co-directs the Institute for Justice and Wellbeing uh, that's at Binghamton, right, Nicole? Yeah. And uh, she's the author of Globalization and Global Justice, Shrinking Distance, Expanding Obligations. That was published by Cambridge University Press in 2012. And also of Global Health Impact, Extending Access to Essential Medicine, which just came out. Uh, and she's published very widely in journals in philosophy, economics, and public health. Uh, her talk today is entitled Responding to the Tragedies of Our Time, The Human Right to Health and the Virtue of Creative Resolve. I'm really delighted uh, to have such a, a, a very central topic as our first one for today, um, since it really addresses this crucial question of both health and the, the status of human rights which um, so quite a number of us working in the global justice area I think has tremendous potential, uh, especially in as much as they are in principle recognized in the world at large, if not in practice. So with that said, I'd like to uh, welcome Nicole for her presentation followed by a discussion. Thank you, yeah. Um, I'm just delighted to be back. I really appreciate your uh, inviting me. And can I just ask if the screen's showing the right way before I yes, start? Yes, it's great. Okay. Beautiful, at least for me. Yeah. So um, I guess this uh, comes out of the, the book that I just finished on global health, but it's something I'm still thinking about and starting to try to apply in a pretty practical way. So I'm trying to incorporate more stories um, uh, uh, into this this sort of talk, which you'll find if you're interested in a little more philosophical form in the second chapter of the book that just came out. So um, with that said, <laughs> thank you again. All right, so we live, in, we live in tragic times. Millions are sheltering in place to avoid exacerbating the coronavirus pandemic. And the question I, I wanna consider is how should we respond to these tragedies? I'm gonna argue today that the human right to health can help us do this because it inspires human rights advocates, claimants, and beneficiaries, um, uh, and those uh, with the responsibility for fulfilling the right to try hard to satisfy its claims. Um, so the right should and often do, does give rise to what I'm going to call the virtue of creative resolve, which is a fundamental commitment to avoiding um, uh, what appear to be a tragic, appear to be tragic dilemmas um, with creative action. So contra critics, we shouldn't reject the human right to health, even if it can't tell us how to ration resources. Okay. Um, so now my screen doesn't want to move. I'm not sure. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. Rather, what it should uh, do for us, or what it can do for us, I think, is give us a response to apparent tragedy and motivating us uh, to stake our claims and find creative ways of helping everyone live a, a minimally good life uh, and meet their basic health need. So as I understand the human right to health, it's indispensable for the exercise of other human rights. Uh, on my view, um, 
people have a right um, to the highest attainable standard conducive to living what I call a minimally good life, or as I put it, I think in international law, dignified life. And this gives us rights to things like food and water, shelter and education, as well as healthcare and um, essential medicines, um, for instance. I hope that what I'll argue will be compatible with different conceptions of, of the basis for the right and perhaps also on its scope. So I'll just argue that, um, that the right should give rise uh, to the virtue of creative resolve, which again is this fundamental commitment to finding creative solutions to what appear to be tragic uh, dilemmas. Okay. Uh, as I alluded to, some think that we should reject the right to health because it can't tell us how to ration scarce health resources. As you know, we're in the middle of the, the COVID pandemic, uh, the questions about how we should ration vaccines and other resources are really pressing in normal times, how we should set up health systems uh, to ration this scarce resource are also really pressing. But I wanna argue that um, we shouldn't reject the right because it does something more important for us. It, it, I think it can inform our uh, rationing decisions, but what it can, can do most importantly is give us a response to this apparent tragedy in, in motivating us to search for ways of fulfilling everyone's basic health needs. Okay. So before explaining uh, the virtue of creative resolve and uh, talking about a vice that at least can undermine it, I want to consider how one human rights organization uh, fought drug resistant TB when and uh, no one thought it was possible in a cost-effective way. So, um, because I think it'll illustrate the virtue. Um, Partners in Health is the organization I'm talking about and it was committed to promoting everyone's human right to health. It refused to accept the claim um, that it was just impossible to provide treatment for drug-resistant TB because it costs too much. And instead came up with creative new ways of treating people even in some of the most challenging circumstances in the, in the slums of Peru and then showed that good treatment outcomes were possible so that funding for TB treatment expanded significantly around the world. I think that because they demonstrated creative resolve, partners and health helped expand global access to care. But what does this virtue require? So um, as a first class, to have the virtue, we need to do three things. We must commit, imagine, and act to fulfill human rights. I think the virtue goes much beyond the human right to health and even human rights in general, but uh, in this circumstance, the first thing we need to do is then question evidence against the possibility of fulfilling moral demands and in particular the right to health. Take Jonathan Mann, uh, so, so to do this, okay, sorry. So, so to do this, you can raise many different questions, right? So you can question evidence against the possibility of fulfilling the right, um, its import uh, the, of that evidence or, or its implications. Um, and I'll just give you an example of someone who did this, I think, particularly well. So Jonathan Mann was the former director of the World um, WHO Global Program on AIDS, and he advocated for a human rights-driven approach to combating AIDS, an approach that fought the virus, but also combated poverty, oppression, inequality, and gender-based violence, which eased the spread of the disease. Mann forced the world to take responsibility for the problem and because he questioned the status quo, I think his philosophy was comprehensive and effective. So when he encountered roadblocks, he challenged, uh, he challenged them. In 1990, Mann resigned as the director of the global program uh, on AIDS, charging that the WHO director general um, was failing in the fight. And in 1994, speaking at the president's advisory council on AIDS, he accused the National Institutes of Health of violating human rights by failing to advance research on a vaccine to fight AIDS. The second uh, condition for creative resolve uh, then is uh, after questioning evidence that it's impossible to fulfill the right is to seek out creative ways of doing that. So it's important to consider all of the options on the table and then exercise moral imagination to come up with new ones. So here's a, another concrete example for you. Suppose, um, take this uh, example of a doctor in Liberia who realized that many people simply couldn't get to the hospitals to get the care they needed. They must take a, a day long journey, you know, by bus and walking, motorbike and so forth to get there. And so what he did was he created a system of community health workers to provide care for people who didn't have immediate access to care. Now in Liberia, there's the nonprofit Last Mile Health, which helps fulfill its commitment to promoting human rights 
and serving the poor, vulnerable, and most marginalized, by helping train, equip, and pay community health workers. I think it's important to come up with these kinds of imaginative solutions um, to addressing health problems, as well as to fulfill the underlying needs for things like medical doctors, because they can be deciding, it can be a deciding factor between life and death in developing countries. The third and final condition for creative resolve requires action. So to fulfill the human right to health and other moral rights, we have to actively try to overcome barriers to doing that. Creative resolve requires a measure of grit, will, or resoluteness. It's not enough to just think creatively, to question the status quo, but we have to act. So consider how creative resolve um, was exemplified in the fight to eradicate polio, which the WHO Africa region actually eradicated on August 25th of this year. So the fight for, against polio is this truly grassroots endeavor um, from the start, but major problems often arose. It was one of the major problems is kind of, it's really difficult to reach remote locations. And to overcome this, the polio eradication campaign engaged in micro planning. They used satellite maps to show where every single house was located, even in the remotest communities. Uh, they tracked transit communities, they marked fingers. In some communities, there was lack of engagement, in others hostility from minority groups to the government. So to get vaccinations to people, polio workers have done everything from write messages on brick kilns to send mobile workers to nomadic populations and put posts up at, uh, uh, vaccination posts up at bus stations. Vaccinators walk between houses, they mark them with chalk and the children with indelible ink, and they track the virus with biological assay surveys and environmental surveillance to decide if the cases are wild polio or from the vaccine itself. So some vaccine types actually produce a small percentage of infections. In India, for instance, they essentially created a secondary national shadow health system of more than 900,000 workers. And vaccinators were so creative and persistent that they employed town criers to walk through streets and tell people about the vaccines. They had parades in the middle of villages to let people know they were there. And they even gave children in Afghanistan their polio vaccinations at a circus. Okay, so each of the conditions for creative resolve is constrained by a proviso. That is, one must be inclined to fulfill them insofar as possible and permissible. One should question evidence that fulfilling a right is impossible, search for ways of fulfilling it, and try to do so, but only barring conclusive proof that the demands can't be met in an acceptable way. Many of those who lack creative resolve are conservative with a small c. So as Michael Oakenshot puts it, to be conservative is to prefer the familiar to the unknown, the actual to the possible, the limited to the uh, abounded, the near to the distant, the sufficient to the superabundant, the convenient to the perfect, present laughter to utopia bliss. That's one of my favorite quotes. So rather than striving for what's um, uh, the best possible results um, or whatever that might be in some domain, conservatives really embrace the status quo. They often do that because they think that existing structures and institutions have proven themselves and they don't value creative thinking or striving to make things better. Still, I think we have to reform these practices to fulfill human rights claims unless there's no acceptable way of doing that. Okay. Since people who don't think change is possible or desirable often lack the virtue of creative resolve, hope is important for that virtue. So hope at least requires desiring an end one believes is possible but not certain. Many of those who don't think there's an obligation to try to do things that seem impossible endorse what philosophers call an epistemic version of the odd implies can principle. So they don't think we have to if we don't think it's possible. Um, Moreover, those who don't care about moral imperatives, um, like fulfilling a human right to health, probably aren't going to try very hard to fulfill it. One, um, one has to try hard to fulfill the human right to health claims, however, as long as one's warranted in doing so for all one knows. It's enough if one doesn't have conclusive reasons to believe if fulfilling these requirements are impossible or impermissible. So we have to cultivate the virtue of creative resolve to fulfill the human rights claims. And we might need moral improvisation to come up with acceptable ways of fulfilling the rights demands in many circumstances. So in some cases, creative resolve is what um, Jonathan Lear calls a radical hope. Even when it's not clear how to fulfill all potentially competing claims, we have reasons to find ways of doing so. So we should avoid making tragic choices, even if avoiding them is very difficult or very demanding. We should come up with better alternatives. As Kant put it, um, 
It doesn't matter how many doubts may be raised against my hopes from history, which if they were proved, could move me to desist from a task so apparently futile. As long as these doubts cannot be made quite certain, I can't exchange the duty for the rule of prudence not to attempt them practicable. On my account then, the human right to health is not aspirational, it's inspirational. Even creative resolve has its internal limits though. So I, I've, I've said this before, but I put it this way. When the moral costs of trying to fulfill a right's claims are actually fulfilling them are too great, then we don't have to do so. That is, we should stop searching for ways of fulfilling these claims when we know the moral costs of the search outweigh the benefits in terms of likelihood of success. That's why the final condition for the virtue only requires that barring conclusive proof that moral demands can't be met acceptably, we should fulfill them insofar as possible. Okay. Um, the argument that the human right to health should give rise to state of resolve is this. When something is important as protecting individuals' basic rights is at stake and trying to do so is warranted for all we know, then we should resolve to exercise our moral imaginations in doing so. Even in the face of apparent tragedy, then we shouldn't fail to fulfill an apparent moral requirement on the assumption that there are no good alternatives. The requirement to try hard to fulfill these uh, claims should be particularly compelling given that people often fail morally when they don't question their assumptions. So there's significant psychological evidence that we generally fail to consider enough alternatives in making decisions. And people may lack moral imagination because they take a too narrow view of feasibility or possibility, they assume tight uh, time frames and financial constraints. And some people also seem to have a pretty pessimistic view of human nature, politics, and political philosophy. Moreover, there's evidence that when we imagine ourselves succeeding in task, we're more likely to do that. Perhaps biggest fantasies or what Cheshire Calhoun calls imaginative projections influence our sense of agency. So hope can energize us to set goals and act on plans to achieve them. For all of those reasons, I think we should often look for alternatives to what seem to be tragic dilemmas. Okay, so what can the human rights health do for us more concretely? Um, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> all right. Consider the worry that the human rights health can't govern the distribution of scarce resources in states healthcare system. So critics point out, um, that we already know health is important and a right to it can at best establish that there's a right to universal health care. They might argue that the right can't support the kinds of health systems that we really need. So this is Gopal Srinivasan's argument, but he says such health systems like England's National Health Service and Canada's medical care have to regulate the distribution of health resources according to fair rules that take into some benefits of health technologies available given a budget for care. But the human rights health doesn't really help us with this comparative evaluation of medically effective services, or even tell us what health promoting services we can rule out. And critics argue that given that there's social determinants of health, we need to know how to allocate resources between the health sector and other sectors in deciding what healthcare budget to have. And we have to weigh and balance entitlements to different kinds of things and health is only one of them. So again, the human rights health isn't supposed to be able to provide the requisite guidance. And if international assistance is required for countries to have adequate resources to spend, um, then we have, uh, have to have a theory of global justice to decide how much resources we have to give. And again, the human rights health can't help us, say the critics. So perhaps a human rights health wouldn't have to help us decide how to allocate these resources if rationing weren't required, but they believe rationing is required. Okay, so it's worth considering then the argument, for, best argument for rationing in the literature, okay. Uh, and it goes like this, there's two ways of allocating resources, rationing and just fulfilling health needs until resources run out. And if we do the latter, then uh, resources will run out because the rate of growth of costs in healthcare technology exceeds the rate of growth of GDP, at least in OECD countries in, in recent decades. Okay, and so what'll happen is we'll leave some needs unmet if we just spend it all. <laughs> so the distribution then won't be in line with any plausible principles of justice. I think human rights advocates should question that argument for rationing. Um, I think we should be willing to ration if it proves necessary, but more evidence is required to establish that rationing is required by justice. So the most 
recent data doesn't really support the claim that expenditure is rising fast rising faster than gdp in oecd countries or very much at all and this was pre-pandemic data so you know not sure so much now but you saw like this bump on the graph there to your or to my left anyway um and that's in 2009 that was due to falling gdp during the economic crisis but it was relatively flat it's an artistic rendering uh, and even if countries can't spend uh, as great a proportion of GDP on healthcare as the US, for instance, many countries spend a lot less on GDP on healthcare and achieve better results. So the US is an outlier. We were on this artistically rendered graph far below um, expected health benefits uh, for spending. We spend much more for less good health. Greater spending past a per certain point isn't clearly effective in promoting uh, key health outcomes either. So here's child mortality versus health spending. You see a great drop initially, but then it basically flattens out. And that's true for a variety of, of different things. So developing countries might prefer to take a very different health systems development path than the US, for instance, that constrains the cost of healthcare significantly. They could focus on ensuring equitable access to the social determinants of health, things like adequate food, water, sanitation, as well as basic health services, rather than trying to ration scarce resources. We need a serious empirical argument to establish that rationing is necessary, and I don't think that um, the argument I was talking about really provides that. But you could try to buttress the argument, right? So you can say medical technology doesn't usually help us do things more cheaply, it helps us do new things, and the cost of technology will rise as wage rates increase around the world and populations live longer, requiring expensive end-of-life care. But of course, those trends won't continue indefinitely. So the UN projects, for instance, the rate of growth of life expectancy will slow this century, and it's already slowed in developing countries, or sorry, developed countries. But even if the costs of healthcare technology do start rising faster than GDP, they might decline with appropriate changes in policy. And not all technology fulfills the kinds of needs at issue for the human right to health. One example of a policy change we might implement is something like the Health Impact Fund, which would reward companies for their innovations based on the health impacts of their technology, rather than just letting them charge whatever they want, uh, prim find primarily focus on fulfilling the needs of rich patients um, uh, in terms of chronic conditions. Okay. We can also expand the budget for care. So we shouldn't suppose rationing health care is necessary given a set budget, budget constraint. Oh boy, my program crashed. Can you guys still hear me? Uh, yeah, we hear you, but okay. um, give me one second. Oh, it's downloading, yeah. It's gonna open up again. I mean, I can go on too if you want. It's this. It sounded weird. like a, it looked like a good syllabus there that we saw briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Feedback form, HIPAA violation. <laughs> mm. Oh well. Maybe you can cut it out of any video you'll post here. So. Yeah, don't worry. I'll fix it. <laughs> so you. it won't forever be um, part of your presentation. I appreciate it. Okay, now we're going to go down. Slow display setting. I don't know. Okay. So, talking about expanding the budget for care. And. Almost there. Stories of technology. All right. So basically, um, I was suggesting that even if you know GDP does rise faster, or health spending rises faster than GDP, um, we might be able to expand the budget for care. So we shouldn't suppose rationing health care is necessary given a set budget constraint. And doing that would require the assumption that we should optimize under that budget constraint when it might be the case that we should instead expand the budget to meet everyone's needs. Of course, the money to expand the budget has to come from somewhere, but securing it might not result in a failure to, uh, a failure to fulfill other rights or requirements of justice. Consider just the COVID pandemic. Um, I think the virtue of creative resolve is necessary to combat the pandemic, ensuring that every individual has access to potentially life-saving um, vaccines and medical treatment. If you look at the situation, you see that 80% of manufacturing capacity is actually in the generic sector. So there should be no patents in a pandemic. Utilizing that capacity and rewarding companies for their 
uh, new interventions in other ways, based perhaps on their global health impact of their technologies, could help us greatly limit the need to ration. The important point, though, is just this. Rationing isn't just deciding to use resources effectively to help some people rather than others. It's choosing to let people suffer and die and direct resources towards helping other people. So we need to make sure it's really necessary. We should try hard to come up with creative ways of fulfilling everyone's basic health needs. And we should be no more willing to make a policy decision that will result in suffering and death than we should be to save only some of those drowning in a shallow pool right before our eyes. Sometimes we can't help everyone, but to respect basic rights and the people that have them, we have to make sure that we must make such a tragic choice. The crux of my disagreement with critics who argue that we should reject the human right to health because it can't on its own tell us how to distribute scarce resources is this. I don't believe the human right to health has to play that role or even that it should. Rather, I think the right does something much more important for us. It motivates us to try hard to fulfill its claims. Nothing in this argument denies that if we do need a ration, the human right to health can help us do that. I think the virtue of creative resolve may even help us figure out how to make progress in realizing the rights to man. So we can't simply decide to help those in the cities first because it's cheaper than helping those who live in rural areas if we embrace the right. And if we exercise a moral imagination, we may find good ways of helping those in the cities and the country. The virtue itself specifies that we shouldn't persist in fulfilling the human right to health demands when doing so is impossible or impermissible. But I stress the commitment or positive side of the virtue because I think it's often what's lacking in international affairs. It's not that most people are trying too hard to fulfill human rights, but that few try hard enough. Millions lack access to essential medicines, for instance, and few are committed to helping them meet those needs. We should try harder, try harder, try harder. The underlying problems that we need to address are moral as well as technical. So we don't just need creativity in coming up with new ways of treating deadly diseases and getting medicines to people where there's the political will to do that. We need creative ways of getting people to think differently about their obligations and take them seriously when they lack the will to do it. The human rights health can and should give rise to this result. We should, like Martin Luther King, refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. The human right to health is a powerful practical tool in many contexts because it can help us question evidence that it's impossible to fill its dictates, criticizing things like immigration and trade policies, international aid conditionality, the lack of scientific research and development on new drugs for some of the world's worst problems, the way clinical trials are conducted and so forth. And when people commit to fulfilling the human right to health, they often think creatively about what needs to be done. So human rights claims ground proposals for positive change, like the Framework Convention on Global Health that Larry Gossin's promoting, or my own Global Health Impact Project, which is an attempt to think creatively about how we can use human rights indicators to set clear targets, evaluate performance, and meet needs. Finally, international monitoring bodies, uh, lawyers and national and international courts, others, <laughs> often use soft administration of law, naming and shaming, as well as incentivizing governments, international organizations, corporations, and other agents to respect, protect, and fulfill rights. They use these human rights indicators, for instance, to hold agents to account. And activists have shown great ingenuity in combating the AIDS crisis by creating new funding mechanisms like PEPFAR, the Global Fund, and UNIDAID, expanding healthcare access via community health workers, increasing the market for lower cost generic medicines, empowering patients, putting new proposals for innovative research and development mechanisms on the table, and improving care for many conditions in poor countries. There's a long way to go, but consider a concrete example. The human right to health and giving rise to creative resolve has helped some overcome what appeared to be impossible barriers to helping people access um, essential medicine. So since 2000, more than 5 million people have secured access to treatment for AIDS in developing countries, partly because a global movement to expand access to essential medicines um, was fostered. So human rights-based organizations like South Africa's Treatment Action Campaign protested when pharmaceutical companies resisted attempts to get them to lower their prices, creating this global movement for access to medicines. 
They simply refused to accept that price reductions were impossible. And then they came up with creative ways of educating patients and linking information about health to rights to empower marginalized people to demand uh, access to medicines. They gave them both voice and visibility. And the cost of first line treatments fell from about $12,000 per patient a year per year to about $350 per patient. Once the generic company Cipla offered those uh, medicines at a lower price. Commitment to producing drugs for the poor at a reasonable price was the basis for Cipla's move to lower prices. And as the CEO put it, healthcare cannot be reduced to a simple business. It's humanitarian in nature and none should be denied access because of high prices. I believe that the human right health should and often does galvanize the moral resolve for finding creative solutions to what appear to be these hopelessly technical rationing problems involving truly tragic trade-offs. Many ways that the human right health is and might be used to bring about positive change in international affairs depend on it inspiring beneficiaries to stake their claims, advocates to rise to its defense, and duty bearers to fulfill obligations. These claimants, advocates, and duty bearers have great hopes. They believe in seeking a brighter future in which everyone can secure at least a basic minimum of health. The human rights health inspires a resolve human rights claimants, advocates, and duty bearers need to come up with creative ways of fulfilling its claims. Recognizing the existence of <laughs> human rights is important for acknowledging individuals' equality and humanity, even if these rights don't help us resolve hard questions about the proper distribution of medical resources. I've argued that we should embrace it because the human right to health plays an important role of fostering the virtue of creative resolve. This is the fundamental commitment again to finding creative solutions to tragic dilemmas. Rather than helping us decide how to ration resources, the right gives us a reason to find ways of fulfilling everyone's claims. It again gives us a response to apparent tragedy and motivating us to search for ways of overcoming it. We need the resolve to aid people beyond borders, the commitment to come up with and implement creative ways of overcoming these and other barriers to fulfilling rights. With creative resolve, we can successfully fight back the COVID-19 pandemic and other major global health threats, as we've done with diseases in the past, regardless of national differences and interests. Take smallpox, for example. The disease was basically eradicated throughout the Americas in the mid-1960s, that is, during the Cold War. And when the Soviet Union proposed a global eradication campaign, an American led the campaign to eliminate it. It took incredible creativity and resolve to reach people even in the remotest corners of the earth. And it required building one of the largest UN campaigns ever. When mass vaccination didn't stop the virus, the campaign pioneered ring vaccinations, a contact tracing based immunization strategy that eventually led to them conquering the disease. The fact that smallpox, one of the greatest pandemics of all time, was eliminated globally during the Cold War shows that anything really is possible. There you go. Thank you. Okay, very nice. Thank you very much. So if you, uh, yes, we should do a little applause, virtual applause. Uh, so if you don't mind closing that so we yeah. can, uh, I can see who would like to ask questions. Um, let me do gallery view. And uh, please uh, let me know if you have some questions. That was, uh, we'll start with Sheehan, please. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I have a question about your argument, um, the limits of virtue, that slide. And you argue that when the moral costs of uh, fulfilling the right exceeds the benefits, we need, to, we need not to do so. I wonder how we should uh, do this cost uh, benefit analysis and what standard we should adopt. Also, who gets to decide? Yeah, I mean, so I have a view of this. I think the virtue is um, uh, quasi objective. Um, so I think, I guess, I think that, you know, there are facts about the matter. We may not know when it is actually permissible for us to stop. And so we're going to have to do our best guess about that. But we can get it wrong, right? Um, so it may be that, no, there was a solution there and we just didn't find it. And I'll give you an example of this. And I, I don't, I feel like there's just sort of two different moral judgments we're, we're going to want to make. So I talk um, 
I was listening to this podcast and there's this woman who was in Katrina, you know, there's this hurricane and they're, they're in the hospital and like the, they got this patient, you know, she's in, intubated him. She's, you know, pumping the oxygen bag and she's trying to get him up to where the helicopters come in, and the helicopters aren't coming. Right. And at some point a doctor turns to her and is like, look, you're going to have to let that guy go. He needs oxygen and you know, we don't have oxygen. And so she holds that guy in her arms and then he dies. And um, I think that's the point that you should personally be when you give up, like you should go to that edge. I do think that it's quite possible that in fact, there was a better solution, right? And that creative resolve demanded in a certain sense that we find it. And one of those solutions would be, you know, I don't know the guy's disease, I'm not a, a nurse or whatever, but you know, it might've been possible to manually pump that bag. And there were about 200 people, I think, in that hospital waiting room. So maybe she could have lined up enough volunteers to do it, right? And she should have done it if that was possible. In fact, I heard a story that during COVID, um, you know, with the babies that are on ventilators, they took some off and had them manually pump the bags and that allowed the babies to survive, no bad outcomes. So I don't know, you know, I don't know if, because um, I wasn't in that situation, I don't know if that um, was possible. But if it was, um, I think that's, you know, a good example of what the right really demands. And then you, you might well say, you know, the nurse is not blameworthy, right? Surely she's not blameworthy. She did everything she could do. She just failed to have, you know, inculcated the virtue appropriately. And it might be a, a failing of her society in not having inculcated that virtue appropriately. Um, but it, it might be a blameless one. So I wanna say that they're just different, you know, there's objective standards of you know, what the, the virtue and what the human right demands and what we should do. But then there are also, you know, reasons for holding people, you know, letting them off the hook when we don't get quite that far. Yeah. Well, thank you. We have a question from Jesse. Hi. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for your talk. That was that was wonderful, and you really gave me a lot of really important things to think about. Um, I don't have so much of a coherent question as much as I would just like to get your thoughts on something that came up when I was um, listening to you, and it's this idea of people lacking the will to, like, I guess, actualize creative resolve. And you mentioned uh, lack of hope and doubt as barriers to creative resolve. And I'm just curious about um, what you think about more systemic barriers and structural barriers to creative resolve, like people who may not be able to even enter an imaginative space to even begin to start thinking about these things just because of, uh, as I said, like systemic and structural barriers that prohibit them from even entering that realm. So I'm just curious what you think about that. No, oh, that's a really good point. So, uh, so I think that empirically hope is necessary for many people and it's unfortunate, actually. I don't think um, hope on the standard definition where it's just believing something is possible and, and desiring it um, uh, gets you off. Like the lack of hope, it certainly doesn't get you off the hook. Uh, and, and that if, if, if you're like me, you'll act against hope, right? And the, uh, an absence of hope, like I think you should do it. And some people just see that as impossible, right? They, they lack the desire, they're not gonna act on it. And I think it depends on your, your characterization of, you know, um, I guess, Humea. if you're a human or you're not about these things or something, but whether you think that that makes sense to say that we would be obligated even when we, when we um, uh, lack hope or something, um, or that it, whether, I guess, whether it's empirically necessary, it's poorly said, you know, I mean, I think that you can do it even if you don't have hope and you should. And, um, and then I think there's, you know, again, there's situations like where, you know, we haven't this, you know, this hasn't been a virtue that is inculcated widely in society. I think, you know, there's a Christian virtue of, of hope um, that is advocated for, but it's, you know, usually in the context, I think of, you know, hope for the afterlife or hope for things beyond this world. And, and that's not at all what I'm talking about. So um, if we recognize this virtue and then it will give us reasons to try to inculcate it, if we think it is a genuine virtue that people ought to have, that we ought to train people to have, then I think we're going to, we're going to have to address those systemic barriers. I mean, it gives you a reason um, to say we need to ensure that all children are getting the kinds of education that they can um, to exercise this virtue. And, um, I don't know if I have a lot of, of insightful things to say, but I think it's a really good point. It's a fair point that we, we do need to, you know, take into account the ways in which we're limited by uh, institutions, institutional structures, our history, our, you know, opportunities and so forth. And that, again, those might be things that get some people off the hook more than others if, if they fail to exercise creative resolve when you know, the human right to health demands it, for instance. Um, do you have more thoughts? Thank you.
<laughs> other questions? I can certainly come up with some, but I want others to come first. Hi, thank you Claudia. so much. Mm -hmm. That was great. Um, I've never really had experience with like a more empirical um, data as combined with um, an imperative or like a philosophical call to action. I've read Radical Hope, which I really, really loved. I um, love the premise. I think he's wrong. I think Sitting Bull had the Radical Hope. Uh, uh, but um, anyway, a, and I wanted um, to ask, I think, also maybe like pushing back both um, with Jesse and uh, what you just said, both like, I think it's entirely true, the institutions and the barriers errors are like super there, especially in um, the material sense. But I guess I'm wondering if, if interacting with such institutions or like what we may call like higher education is in fact um, actually unavailable to people in spaces? Like, does it have to look the same way? Like, I think, um, and I'm sorry if I'm misrepresenting you, Jesse. No, no. Uh, um, but the like um, ability to start thinking about these things, I guess I kind of want to challenge that as it seems that You'd be thinking, Can I clarify what I meant? Yeah, for sure. Because so what I meant wasn't that people lacked like the cognitive faculties. It was more like people who are more concerned with making sure their child is taken care of or that they have food on the table instead of being able to sit down and think about what they can do to participate civically is what I meant more. Yeah. Okay, cool. And I think that's what I was trying to articulate um, in that I think uh, basically like as you're saying, um, those things itself like are that education like that is participation in um in paying your rent and taking care of your child i guess is um what i'm meaning to say and now i'm getting lost in what my actual question was because like now my premise got kind of um <laughs> I'm sure Nicole can weigh in anyway. I, mean, I, I don't know if I quite got your question, so you might have to repeat it. But uh, so, you know, when you're talking about Lear and sitting, well, I don't know uh, if, if, you know, I use this example where I'm like, you know, a prisoner, like, can imagine that they're free from their chains. But that's really not an example of creative resolve, right? Like, there's a failure <laughs> creative resolve there. So I, maybe that is, is a similar point or not. I don't know. Um, and then, you know, this this question about, you know, people who, who have other obligations like to their children, um, how does that play in? I mean, they may really be in a tragic dilemma, right? Like, you know, there may be a call or a claim on them to fulfill the human rights health. I, I'm just supposing you're, that's what you're suggesting. And therefore, like, there's a, there's a tragic situation where they either do that or they, you know, they can't vote or whatever they have to do because they got to take care of their kid. And that's just really sad. I mean, I, I guess it depends on how you think about the human rights yeah. obligations, right? They just might not have an obligation to vote that day because, you know, there's enough other people that are obligated to vote and they have to take care of their kid. There's no babysitter or, or they can't bring them to the polls because they're sick or something. So, I mean, I, I think it, in my, in my, you know, I don't talk a lot about what I think the human right to health obligations are yeah. in this sort of chapter of sort of book, uh, a part of the, the, in the presentation. Um, you know, I do think that the obligations are, I, I, I take it that the obligations um, fall in the first place on states, but secondarily on the international community, and those are very demanding obligations. I do think everybody has some human rights based obligations, for instance, not to make interfere with the fulfillment of human rights or make it more difficult or impossible for people to access the objects of their rights and to participate in institutions and so forth. And, and so, you know, I, I guess I'm not, you know, I'm not sure how much of a individual obligation there is uh, for people to fulfill human rights to help. Like it could depend on who you are, what your role is, if you're a hospital administrator versus, you know, individual and so forth. Um, so that can complicate things too. But if, if you're looking at, you know, should everybody have this virtue of creative resolve when something really important is on the table and they do have an obligation to fulfill that thing, I want to say yes, unless something else really, you know, significant is at stake, something so important that like fulfilling the right wouldn't be required of them anymore. Um, and at that point, then, you know, uh, they haven't failed. It's just that they never had the obligation in the first place or something probably. 
So I want to I want to say that the obligations uh, that he writes in Taylor should become possible, right? So we, we know this from like Rawls, and he says, you know the limits of your freedom kind of end where everybody else's freedom begins, right? So we don't have perfect rights to full freedom. That's not what you mean when, you know, people should be free and equal. Like people should have some rights to do certain kinds of things that respect other people's rights. And so, um, you know, these ideas of the conflicts between rights to fulfilling rights to health and rights to education, I guess I want to, insofar as possible, say that they really don't conflict, that it's really just where the rights are ending. Um, but you can have a different view of that. And then, you know, sometimes we're going to have cases where people have these really tragic conflicts um, just based on rights themselves. I don't know. Is that helpful? Yeah. And I don't think I, um, that was super helpful in clarifying. Um, less so, I think, on the individual restraints, like of an individual actor to participate. But I guess um, restraints, perhaps, like, of a group of individuals from participating in a certain type of obligation, which I think you spoke to just now saying like, what constitutes that obligation or what does it consist of yeah. um, can mean different things. So I think that is kind of where my, I was like, oh. How yeah, I'll say one more thing if it's okay. If it's just, just that, um, you know, so I think there's two ways of thinking about, if you think the duty bear is a state, right? <laughs> the duty bear is a collective of some kind. So you can think about that, you know, as an obligation of the collective, or you can think about that as a distributive obligation of individuals within the collective, right? Like there's a certain distribution of responsibilities and so forth. So you can kind of be a realist or I guess an anti-realist about the obligations of uh, institutions. And I don't know, I, I kind of, you know, I like the fictionalist reading or whatever best. Like I kind of think that you know, these are really obligations of individuals and their institutional roles or something. But I don't know that, like, I have to come down on that. And, you know, if it's a gloss when you say the state is obligated to, you know, act with creative resolve, right? I guess that's fine, you know, that's fine. Um, is that helpful at all? Or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I want to, uh, well, you mentioned, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm happy to hold them back. Uh, first of all, one of them was about this individual or social virtue issue. I, I, it's unclear to me how you're intending it because normally virtues are virtues of individual, are thought of as virtues of individuals, but this one seems very, very social and has ties to institutional action as well. And I think it would be helpful to specify how you uh, articulate those connections between I mean, the I guess, social and the institutional level. That's one question of many. You should push me on this, Carol, because, so, so when I read the literature, like, okay, in order for institutions to have obligations, they have to be agents of certain sorts. And there's all these different accounts of what constitutes institutional agency. So then there becomes this big philosophical burden on me. The argument for that, to me, I've never been that impressed with, and maybe I'm missing with it, but I sat in on Bratman's class on this. So like, um, I think it's like, well, you know, there's certain cases in which individuals lack agency of the kind that's necessary for moral re responsibility. I'm not even interested in moral responsibility, per se. Like, I'm interested in, in liability, like moral liability. So uh, the idea that, okay, you know, people can be drunk then, they're not agents, so they, they lack certain capacities. What, what do the, you know, how does the structure of institutions what it have to be such that institution can be an agent that can bear responsibilities? I don't know, like, that I find the burden to be very high. Like, I don't, I personally don't find, I don't connect with that philosophical challenge enough to think that I really want to give an answer to the question of what makes the institution a kind of agent that can bear responsibilities. But if states can be those agents, and I think most people think that they can, um, and corporations maybe, uh, then, you know, whatever those, those things are in place, and then we say, okay, well, this agent can have responsibilities. One of the responsibilities is to fulfill human rights. One of the responsibilities is to, you know, act with creative resolve or act as an agent who has creative resolve would act if it's an individual, you know, is the idea that, is a worry that, well, they can't, you know, imagine things, they can't come up with creative solutions, states can't think creatively, or, you know, because I, I set it out very much as an individual, you know, virtue. I'm just thinking about people inculcating this virtue in their institutional roles because I have that kind of fictionalist understanding of what the obligations actually come down to. But I could see an objection being like, well, there's certain things states could do, they can act, you know, but they can't, they can't imagine, they never have that kind of capacity, so they can't have this virtue. Am I putting too much into your question or? 
No, no, it was, uh, that's part of it. But the other element is the social nature of it, not necessarily just institutional, because a lot of what you're talking about sometimes is addressed in terms of the idea of solidarity, which is missing here. Uh, and solidarity has uh, both a motivational aspect and also an active aspect of working together with others to affect uh, justice or human rights. And so I just think that it's kind of odd to just go from the virtue of an individual to as the, the single thing that's missing from realizing human rights or the main thing that's missing. Whereas uh, if, they, if people recognized the need to act in solidarity with others, uh, which is a matter of joint action, it could involve social movements and not just institutions, but it's also related to, institu to support for institutions in a way that is missing from an account that just tries to go from an individual virtue to the realization of human rights or that, that selects the, the individual virtue as what we should be mainly focus on. No, that's nice. I mean, so I talk in like one of the papers about this, uh, about how I really think it is like, has this kind of collective aspect. So I give this example of the people, um, Mirazaki, who's at Cornell and might have moved on, is a sociologist or something. He, um, he was a Japanese scholar and he thinks, he talks about this case with Fiji and he says, um, in Fiji, there was this group of indigenous people that wanted to stake their land claims. And they had to, to really succeed and they had to reconceptualize themselves as a corporate agent and then to stake that claim, right? Like act in order to, you know, come up with this kind of creative solution and then they succeeded in, in, um, in acquiring their land rights. Um, but it had a lot to do with their self-conception, how they viewed their action together as a kind of hope for, you know, whatever. Um, and I, I can't do better reconstructing the case to you there, but I use it as an example of creative resolve. So I do think like there is a very, very important social aspect. I think you can see that in the HIV case, for instance, right? It's a social movement, it's an action in solidarity with, and that's really why that act of creative resolve was successful. So I don't want to say that it's the only thing, you know, by any means that we really need to like have to, to succeed in fulfilling rights. Um, I guess, you know, I think of it like my Bernie Sanders, your Hillary Clinton, right? Like I think of this virtue as like, I'm not saying you, but like I think of this virtue as like an approach to political life, uh, an approach to um, uh, engaging in politics and thinking about really concrete pressing problems. Like, I don't know, vaccine distribution, right? Like, okay, everyone's talking about how we're gonna ration these resources and you know, whether we should give it to the first responders first or the old people or the young people or whatever. And sure, that can save more lives, save more life years, achieve a lot of objectives that you might care about, right? But it's playing around at the margins because if you really think about the problem, 80% of our manufacturing capacity is in generics. So if we keep our status quo, if we keep those patents, if we let these companies play this ball game, we're looking at so many more deaths and so much worse outcomes than if we address the fundamental problem that I think creative resolve, you know, really questioning that status quo and then coming up with creative solutions like could help us address. So is that helpful? Okay. I, I see some other people want to ask, but let me just uh, abuse the privilege of chair and just ask one more little thing first, which is, um, uh, it's not so little. Uh, the problem that I see is that creative resolve is just instrumentally valuable in itself as a virtue, and it could be directed to nefarious ends. You know, you could, um, I mean, the Nazis uh, exhibited, just to take a hackneyed case, uh, creative resolve. Uh, so it varies a lot with its, with its goal or with the value of the ends that it seeks to realize. So okay. how do you, how do you yeah, articulate I that? I have a good answer for that. So the way I've defined it, it's question the possibility of meeting genuine, right? Moral demands and seek out creative ways of doing that. So when you have someone like, I don't know, Mao, right? Who really did think pretty creatively and tried to do something, right? He was pursuing an end, but he wasn't actually acting to fulfill that end, right? Like he made some very fundamental mistakes. He sought out creative ways, but he didn't actually act to fulfill that the morally uh, responsible. So he got it massively wrong. Like you can have, um, you know, People who wanted imperialists, right? They often thought they were doing this for human rights-based reasons, but they had some, you know, fundamental like 
factual problems of what they were doing, that in fact, that was not a good way of promoting human rights. So yeah, they exercised certain kind of creativity, right? But they didn't act to fulfill those human rights. So I don't think that it constitutes an example of creative resolve, right? Okay, so that has to- It's an objectively- okay. like, yeah. Let me call on Aaron, it is, I think. You know, I, I will say one more thing, if it's okay. Which is yeah. you know, the instrumentality, but yes, like I think virtues are. I mean, you don't have to agree with me on this, and like you could have a more objective conception of the virtue, but yeah, I think that the virtue gets its import from the, the moral goods that, that you're going for. Um, and so I don't think that's you know, okay. It's yeah. just okay. You, you talk about it as though it's good in itself. Okay, Aaron, and then Callum. Unmute. Now we hear you, I think. No. Not hearing it, not hearing it. Who is talking? I can. Uh, Aaron is trying to, uh, someone here is trying to ask a question. Uh, I'm trying to unmute you. No, still not. Maybe take out the earphones. Um, okay, so we'll go to Callum first while uh, while Aaron works on the problem. Callum, please. Yeah, yeah. First, thanks very much uh, for the talk, which was uh, yeah, food for thought, as as Carol said. So um, my question is about the uh, <coughs> um, role that that human rights plays and how how much emphasis there is on insisting on a human right to health uh, and i can see the argument for how insisting on that human right grounds the um uh the uh, the virtue of of creative I've, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Creative, what's the resolve? Yeah. Uh, resolve. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, yeah, I can see how that goes. From from uh, okay, if you've got this human right to health, then you've got this kind of uh, uh, impulse towards the um, virtue of creative resolve. But I'm w wondering if there are other routes there <laughs> to getting there. Um, and the basic thought being that. Well, if you insist, so say you've got somebody who's facing a difficult decision about whether to, you know, give the vaccine to this person or that person, and they think that it's it's a tragic dilemma, uh, and they could expend a bit of effort to like work out whether it's really a tragic dilemma and maybe exercise a bit of creative resolve and and find another way out. But they, they go, oh, well, I'm not I'm not you know infringing on anyone's rights here because I don't believe in a in a human right to health. So why bother? I'll, I'll just allocate it one way or the other. And we might think, no, what you should have done there is exercise the creative resolve. Well, one way to convince that person to do that would be to say, look, there really is a human right to health. So if you're, if you're failing to exercise your duty of exploring your, your creative resolve, then you're, you're infringing on rights, right? And that's a terrible thing. But another thing you could say to them is just that, okay, it's not infringing rights, but it's still really, really, really important. The stakes are still really, really high. Um, and if you can convince them of that, then maybe again, they'll go, oh yeah, no, the stakes are really high. And even if it's not a rights issue, I should still like devote some effort to doing uh, uh, some, some creative resolve here. Um, and why I think it might be useful to note that is just that there are some people who stick to a kind of minimalist conception of rights and they're very reluctant to add in extra rights because of the way that they conceive rights. And the argument could kind of you know, it might just go through equally well for those people by just saying, okay, you're a minimalist about rights. That's a shame for you. But even if you are, right, you should still care about creative resolve because there's this sort of rights independent thing about the stakes being so high that it kicks in. Right? Does that? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. that argument works too. It sort of depends, like, I think the, um, I don't know, uh, I put it more technically in the book, you know, human rights or claim rights, like, whatever. But, you know, the argument for the human right giving, you know, generating an obligation to exercise creative resolve, I think is, you know, I think it, it works, but you could also, it's, it's 
there are these uh, other papers on the virtue that are sort of more general than human rights. Like I think there's other demanding moral claims, obligations, and so forth that are sufficient to generate, you know, this obligation of being creatively and so forth. So it may not be an effective strategy to say, hey, <laughs> let's argue about human rights right now. Um, this is more, you know, directed to people who are already kind of on board with human rights framework. And I, I guess in some sense, uh, uh, it does respond to that one worry about rights, right? Rights can't tell us how to ration, so we should reject them. I just think that, you know, that's not a good, <laughs> I mean, there's other worries in there too, but you know, that's not a good argument. Um, and then, you know, you might have other reasons for rejecting the right. And I think, okay, we can talk about that too. I do think there's good reasons. This is what I, you know, believe why I've put it in this framework. I think it's a, a good one, one of the main strong reasons we have for helping people, you know, get a basic minimum of health. But so, I mean, I don't think it's fruitless to argue about human rights and so forth. But it, within that, you know, within that human rights framework, if, you, you know, if we're talking to people, or as I see it, talking to people who kind of accept that, I think it's a little more important, right? So to think about what kind of conception of this kind of social or uh, economic right we have at, at stake here. So people think about these social economic rights as purely aspirational, like poor countries should kind of try to get there, like eventually maybe, and others should maybe provide a little aid, but I think that's wrong, right? I think that, that um, the human right to health as you know articulated in international law really does demand a lot um, and should demand a lot and in order to protect our ability to live minimally well so that's what the first chapter of the book kind of argues and then i i think that it demands action now and this is uh, amarta sen amarta sen puts it this way like uh, it demands action now like it's a call to action in the way that uh you know, abolitionists had a call to action than slavery, right? It's a very different and an inspirational conception of the right. It's a very different way of thinking about what the rights require. So that's, you know, part of what's going on in this article. It's within the human rights camp. And then also, you know, whether you want to give a similar argument um, that we should have created resolve outside or inside the human rights framework, I think they'll both work in some cases. And, and, and maybe that's available to you now out of this paper. So trying to sell the paper, <laughs> but yeah, if that's. Okay, Aaron, I think you're, you're gonna work this time. Okay, can I be heard now? Yeah. Awesome, Great. sorry about that earlier. Um, so my, my question has aspects of Carol's and aspects of um, uh, no, Claudia and Jesse's questions from earlier uh, about structural issues. Um, and, and it has to do with, um, kind of the locus of creativity um, and whether you're more committed to a social conception of things there than maybe um, kind of the ambivalence you were uh, stating earlier, just in that it seems like the kind of creativity you're after, um, depending on how you think about create, like a lot of the examples were specific individuals coming up with creative solutions. But it seems like in these kind of big cases where you have to change entire systems and things of that sort to improve the situation as you would for kind of healthcare rights, um, that your creativity is limited by your kind of institutional and social location. And so the part of kind of part of what you have to do is have better groups you have to have better sorts of scientific communities. So for example, if you, if you switch from healthcare to environmental stuff, you kind of have to change these scientific institutions. It doesn't just take individual creativity to figure out solutions for climate change. We have to change how our institutions relate to our scientific institutions. So I wonder if there's kind of a, a very essentially social element there uh, that you, you need. Yeah, very nice comment. Thank you. Um, so, oh, I guess, you know, I think, I think you're absolutely right, right? Uh, so some, um, some of the implications are how we, about for how we organize institutions. Um, some people have said, well, this is just a right to development. I mean, I think it goes beyond even a right to development, but, um, you know, some of those things might be uh, institutional forms that, I guess, we can adapt with current institutions. Like, okay, should we, with an environmental management, you'll say, well, there's this adaptive management process. That's like a creative new way of trying to manage things as they come up rather than, so there may be like things that are compatible with the current institutional forms. And then, I mean, the, the, the virtue 
which is like all about uh, challenging kind of the status quo, challenging the structure of those institutions, right? So the example I gave about patents, um, you know, tying rewards for pharmaceutical innovation to the health impact, that is a radical transformation of our current system of rewarding pharmaceutical innovation. I think hands down and away, it would be way better, right? Like I think if we, now Thomas is here, so I have to say this, right? But I mean, I think um, if we reward based on what we want to get out of these companies, that's what we're going to get. And right now we're getting, you know, medicines to treat chronic conditions or rich patients, like allergy medicines, because that makes the most money. And I think, you know, we, we really do need to align the incentives with the health needs. And, and that would require a lot. I mean, it's very difficult. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult in the way that like, not quite as hard as abolishing slavery. So like, it's not impossible. I don't think it would take a civil war, but it's difficult, right? It's not a, it's not a, a, a change in the margins in the way that, you know, we can make maybe a lot more progress if we just join COVAX right now. And, and you know, that's not that big of a deal, right? But that's hard enough because you're the wrong administration. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I right i don't know if that if, if you see if you see an objection and what you're saying to what i'm proposing or not um i it's not not an objection per se i just wonder if uh uh in particular i'm, I'm thinking about so creativity is kind of a human process right and it's it seems to me that uh if you think of creativity and what I think is probably the most likely or kind of limits to creativity that it's often the social system in which we're embedded that is limiting us right if you think that human thought is limited by kind of this is you know kind of a Marxist or kind of Frankfurt school kind of way of thinking about these things right but um, if you buy into even like part of that and and you think that uh, kind of part of the solution is uh, committed to, um, I guess, social social level action and not individual forms of creativity, kind of social creativity at a, at a wider scale. Um, and so I'm wondering if, I'm not articulating myself particularly well here. Um, I guess, so you, you were kind of saying you weren't sure whether, where, what the import of thinking about whether um, institutions had agency or not, right? And you might think one of the reasons it is important is that there are certain forms of agency um, that individuals, or certain kinds of actions that individual agency isn't sufficient for, right? Um, and that's kind of where, where that comes in. And one of the, the things might be the sorts of creativity you get if you have group level agency or some form of social agency will be distinctive and important to kind of the goals that you want to meet, I guess. And so yeah. I was just wondering if there's more commitment there. Can you good. That's really good. And I like it. Uh, I was just reading Marx or no, it was, I don't know, somebody for one of our comprehensive exams, somebody I'd never read before. I mean, I read a little Marx, but, uh, and, and it was all about social class and how, you know, the class consciousness really determines the kinds of results you're going to get in society. And I was like, oh yeah, that's totally true. Um, but if it is true, right, that's like a super big problem for us because, it means that a lot of these things like that change is not gonna happen. It's just driven by these class forces. And so, you know, all this pouting off is just me spouting off some kind of like class thing, I guess. Uh, I may, maybe I misread it. I claim no expertise here. I probably shouldn't have been grading these exams. I tried to make a case of my, my department colleagues about agree. Um, Anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, I guess these political science questions about like what its forms of institutional agency are really available to us, you know, is a really imp important one, right? I mean, if it turns out that there's just, it's not available to us, that's a limit to the ability to exercise creative resolve as, a, as an individual. I mean, you think about this in very, like I was thinking about it in very prosaic terms, like, okay, you know, if I, if I have a high school education and everyone's told me like, you know, I, I just don't have time and I'm busy and, you know, I'm trying to just feed my family. Like, it's not going to be possible for me to be out there, like maybe protesting on the weekends. Okay. Yeah, that's true. But, um, but yeah, maybe there's sort of deeper things that constrain us. And I, I guess, you know, the first answer is, well, we should change some of those things. Mm -hmm. Like, but if that's not possible, then, you know, I guess you could, you could argue that the virtue is less helpful, the argument's less helpful. Um, 
but I think it's going to be a dissertation, Erin, on class consciousness, which he's working on. Yeah. Uh, uh, Manny, did I see a hand before? Yeah, yeah. I had a, and then I, after that, Jesse. It's, um, kind of just more clarificatory question. It's just about uh, the, I guess, right to health. Um, so this right to health, does that apply just to lives and being, or would it apply potentially to future generations? And if you expand it, maybe to include future generations, or not just humans, right, but potentially animals or ecosystems, would potentially this, um, I guess, you know, virtue of creative resolve, then, you know, generate more, uh, uh, you know, potentially more tragic dilemmas if you try and expand uh, this right to health beyond just, you know, current lives and being uh, of humans and stuff? Good, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that you have to be in existence to have rights. So when people come into existence, they will have rights. And we should make it the case that their rights are not being violated when they come into existence, right? So I have some, I've done some work in population ethics that kind of bears a little bit on this. And I think you should bring people into existence with whatever it is you're able to give them, not help them once they're in existence, for instance. Uh, I don't know if you, I have to think about that. That question is a good one. I just have, haven't thought about it enough. Like, okay, once you add population ethics into this, what is the results going to be? I have thought a lot about the environmental ethics sort of questions a little bit. So like in the context of climate change, I think if you think that animal interests and other kinds of ecosystems, there's many things that play. I have an argument that like, yeah, we have a really big problem because we lack an environmental ethics that can help us address this. So I end up saying something like, yeah, we should just have adaptive management and a lot of hope um, at the end, which is very just unsatisfying. These are published articles, so you can, you can find this if you want. Um, and it's not that helpful here because I don't have a view about like, okay, well, could animals have, I guess, human rights if, if that's, you know, I guess I don't tend to think that's the case, but I don't have arguments really against it. And then of course it could change, um, it could change things really significantly. So yeah, I'm just gonna go with probably, <laughs> probably yes. Um, um, okay. okay, I see a new question from Natalie and then we'll go back to Jesse. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. This is kind of building on Manny's point, but, um, and forgive me if I miss this, this is kind of a clarifying question as well, but how do you distinguish between a right to health and a right to health care? Because in that respect, then like, just in thinking about the environment, then that could um, introduce new kind of obligations as it comes to um, clean air, clean water, et cetera, like the things that promote good health as opposed to the things that just correct for bad health. Yeah, yeah. So I think that um, you know, as I defend the right, I talked a little bit about the social determinants of health. I think those are properly part of the human right to health. So, um, I, of course, it's not something that um, you know. I think it's a right to the socially controllable determinants of health, right? The social determinants of health, insofar as that's socially controllable. So, like, there are things that you know, nobody has a right to be perfectly healthy. It's not attainable. Um, there are limits. To that right, you know, in, in terms of demanding his competing obligations, other rights and things. But in on my view, I think people should the right to health should properly does include um, rights so much more than just health care. But some people disagree about that. Um, I think I do a talk about that, at least in some notes in the book. So I think Tis Tis just definitely doesn't agree with that. Um, and some people even like uh, Gopal Srinivasan argue that, you know, rights to social determinants create these kinds of rights conflicts that, you know, undercut the argument for the existence of the right. And I think, um, you know, you have different ways of going there. I think that, I guess, oh, I can't remember his name. Some famous human rights scholar referred to in the book. <laughs> He's got a nice way of trying to deal with competing obligations and rights. I think it's in, in this Carol's article and I published an article in the journal Social Philosophy where I probably cite this. I, I've forgotten the exact reference. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty failing to remember what I said, but but yeah, I mean, I have a vague way of trying to deal with it, but I, I admit that like there's, you know, there's some problems, right? Like if you start building more into the right, you know, what are the limits of the right of the limits of other rights and how do you deal with those conflicts? And I think it's, it's difficult, but I think um, the really, I want to defend the human rights health really, you know, generates that. So I think people have a right to the kinds of protections of health 
that are necessary and also important for them to secure or live what I call a minimally good life. And I could talk at great length and technical detail about what I mean by that, or just refer you to chapter one of the book, um, depending on what you want. Okay. To um, yeah. Any new people or let's just hear from Jesse again. Uh, probably our last question, unless the new people want to say something. Well, I hope somebody else has something too. But um, so my um, next comment was just, I'm curious about your thoughts about how we go about determining what people's needs are, especially given that for some people, they can't even really express the needs that they have. So there's this issue of how do we even know like the types of needs that need to be met? Is there a limit to the types of needs that we have an obligation to respond to? And how do we go about overcoming um, barriers to people even being able to say, okay, this is what I even need? Good. Yeah. Um, so I don't have to talk, talk about what I mean by a minimally good life. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a like good life. I think people need the fundamental conditions for securing, oh God. It's complicated. It's really, really complicated. You don't want this mouthful. Um, what I do is I distinguish between a reasonable affirmation standard for living a minimally good life, this is Dan Haber's distinction, and a justifiable aspiration as a matter of basic right standards. So I think there's an ambiguity in what we mean by minimally good life. And we can say that some of the lives of the most severely disabled and disadvantaged people will qualify as minimally good in a certain sense, like uh, you know, you think of Kitty uh, uh, Kitty's article, you know, about her daughter. Like, she has all the kinds of care and supported things maybe that she needs um, to live as well as possible, and that's great. And in a certain sense, we can reasonably affirm that. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. So I want to I want to set the standard, you know, fairly high is what people have a justifiable aspiration to attain, and we should help people get as close as possible. And of course, there's a lot of unclarity about well, what counts as close because some of the conditions for living a minimally good life might not do well help you if you know you if you can't attain others or, or if you can't, you know, like if you can't, um, you know, uh, exercise cognitive facilities, for instance, uh, fa faculties, for instance, it might not be, you know, a good idea to try to get you to exercise, educate you as much as possible. It's, you know, it, it's not going to be an effective way of promoting your ability to live minimally well. Um, but then I think there's just a lot of work to be done on that. Like, I think, um, you know, there's some some interesting articles about the what they call anonymous anonymous. I can't say uh, anonymy, but uh, uh, well-being of 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 um, people with autism, for instance. Um, and I have a I had a really interesting, um, brilliant autistic student recently who, you know, argued in her final thesis, sorry, their final thesis that. Um, uh, you know, that you should use um, proxies for, you know, people to stand in and speak for people who actually have the same conditions rather than using, you know, um, a reasonable person standard where anybody's supposed to be able to apply it. So I think there's some interesting work and, and important work to be done on those questions that you, I certainly can't answer right now. So I just want to acknowledge them. It's like, good question. <laughs> Okay, I think we can probably bring this to a close and thank you very much for a really stimulating talk and I open your open attitude to questions is is very, very welcome. And I'm really delighted that we've been able to host you today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for the great questions. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great, great job. And I'm gonna stop the recording, although we can hang around for a minute. So I have to always remember to do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay.